there, this is Cassia. And this is Coden. And welcome to the Ebon Hawk, a podcast where we discuss the Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic games and proposed movie adaptation, as well as Star Wars news. This is episode 5, and this is where the fun begins. Today's topic, we wanted to discuss Darth Revan, also known as Revan the Butcher, or just Revan. He was born in the Outer Rim and was discovered by the Jedi, trained under Jedi Master Kreia, at the same time as Malak later to be Darth Malak. Yeah, and uh, I think his name before he was officially Malak was actually Alec. He actually added the M in the comic book series Knights of the Old Republic, which was published by Dark Horse a few years back so but that's a story for another day but yeah he was born approximately 3994 before battle of yavin uh somewhere in the outer rim and he had lots of jedi masters kreia was his first and last teacher and he he learned like on the planet coruscant as well as dantooine he trained alongside malik and czar leston was one of his teachers as well as vander to tokar last episode i accidentally called vander i called him vander torak but it's vander tokar so hmm. sorry baby yoda's ancestor so i got that wrong and then master rook taught him too and he hated him probably even more for he fell because Rook is kind of a jerk. And in my humble opinion, Kreia is also R and K and Master Doric also trained him. So after the Sith Wars from the Jedi of the Sith, the Mandalorians they invade the Galactic Republic, the Galactic Space, and at first because of coming out of the recent Sith War, the Jedi didn't want to get involved in just wanted to leave it to the Galactic Republic to deal with the Mandalorians. This was unpopular to Revan, and so he, among his followers, decide to band together and put together a, I guess, a battalion to take on the Mandalorians themselves to... to take try action. To, yeah, take action and push them back to their territory. The interesting thing is that group was called the Revan Kiss. So that's kind of like where Revan gets the name Revan from, because he's known as the Revan Kissed. So it's like, we don't really know Revan's real name. We just know the name he ended up eventually taking on. So it's an interesting layer to an interesting character. Yeah, it's also something that I'm just thinking about is that, as we know, Revan eventually turns to the dark side and anakin has a very similar i guess like evolution where he doesn't quite like the council decision and at the same time he's involved with the galactic civil war of uh the trade federation to the galactic republic and ends up leading a whole battalions to victory and which kind of sets him up on like a pride pedestal pushing him to areas where Maybe the Jedi Council didn't see him qualify, but Anakin himself saw himself qualify. So that's kind of a weird or interesting similarity. Yeah, definitely. And then the Revan Kist and his followers, and Malak is still known as Alec at this point. They go to the planet where the Catharian people live, or maybe it's just Cathar, similar to what Juhani is, and they, like, the Mandalorians, like, committed genocide against the Cathars. And one Mandalorian tried to stop the genocide from happening, but the Mandalorians and Mandalore the Ultimate made it, like, they just, like, killed all the Cathars. Revan discovered this, and he put on the Mandalorian's mask, and he's like, I'm gonna wear this until the Mandalorians are taken care of. And he pretty much wore it for a lot of his life, at least. It's kind of a weird promise to not remove a Mandalorian mask until the Mandalorians are defeated. It's like he's putting it in the Mandalorian's face that 
like they're they're fighting against their own face but at the same time it's does revan oh is he doing this out of fear and intimidation or is it just to to serve as a reminder of himself that he's not going to stop until it's done um i think i saw it as like he's not gonna stop until it's finished and kind of to honor the fallen mandalorian's memory so she didn't like die for nothing you know and also it just makes it easier for the comic book artists not to draw a guy perpetually in shadow Mm -hmm. and to have him wear a mask but one of the interesting things i learned reading the knights of the older public book that came out by alex kane was that when they were designing revan they were trying to make him look like the cool characters like darth vader or boba fett and so they kind of took some inspiration from like boba fett to create the mask so it kind of looks mandalorian and then he of course has the hood and the cape and the armor so that kind of makes him look like darth vader so even when they were creating him the mandalorian visual uh cues were there and then they kind of when they're writing the comic book series they kind of made it like so his mask kind of, it kind of came full circle. And that's why he he wears a mask. And even after the Mandalorians were defeated, he would always wear it. And yeah, eventually he ends up being driven over to the dark side. But what's something that's uh, interesting about kind of his transition was that he doesn't give up like his knowledge of the Jedi to fully embrace the dark side because with the Jedi and the Sith, the Sith primarily focused on one branch of the force tree and the Jedi focused one branch on their own force tree. But Revan wanted to keep his knowledge intact and embraced both both the light and the dark, which makes him an incredibly powerful adversary as a Sith Lord. Yeah, part of me still hasn't made peace with Star Wars, The Old Republic, and the Revan novel that kind of ties all of that together. So I'm not in love with the idea of him being brainwashed by a Sith Emperor, and that's why he falls to the dark side. I kind of find it more interesting that, like, maybe he ended up getting, like, post-traumatic stress disorder or something during the Mandalorian Wars, or he fell for a purpose to, like, prepare for a real threat that was gonna throw the galaxy into disarray. And Kraya kind of made it sound like it was more his choice to fall, and he did it, like, as a sacrifice, but... That, and, I mean, I'd even consider the more subtle approach, because, again, yeah, I've, you know, I'm aware of the canon of him being brainwashed by the sith but it would just make sense that in a normal situation for the jedi the jedi don't find themselves in combat very often they're more peacekeepers and that was primarily the the way the jedi operated up until the galactic civil war and it it would make sense to me that just the the act of embracing war is what tilted Revan over to the dark side it wasn't and more of what you're saying is a choice and not so much of brainwashing or a fall but more that in order to maybe win the victories that he won or to save um, individuals that need to be saved he had to embrace aspects of the dark side that you know eventually got him down the path where he lost his way into being more the sith lord than the jedi commander those are some interesting thoughts but yeah maybe we don't love how revan and malik fell to the dark side they did fall to the dark side and after the mandalorian wars they kind of the whole fleet disappeared but then they came back and they decided to go to war with the republic so the jedi are kind of like well They fell to the dark side. Like, what did we tell you was going to happen, you know? It would be hard for the Jedi Council not to, I don't know, feel smug, you know? So. Mm -hmm. And also, back then, too, I I think this is one of the more earlier iterations of the Sith being represented as bad as a moral perspective. Because in the old Republic days the Sith were simply just another faction, another faction in a different aspect of the Force than 
the Jedi and the Republic. So in the Republic's point of view, the Sith were evil, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the Sith were evil. It was just, if you've played Star Wars Battlefront 2, you get the perspective of Iden Verso. So you get her perspective of the Empire basically being all that she knows and what is good against what is considered evil in you know, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Oh, I was thinking you were meeting the original Star Wars Battlefront, and I was very confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm talking about the uh, the controversial one. The new one. Yeah. yeah. That kind of, like, at launch, like, had all the issues. But I hear now it's a pretty fun game. I haven't tried it out yet. Yeah, one day. It's, uh, it's, it's more fun to play private than it is to play online. Yeah, that's usually my experience, too. So the Jedi and the Republic when Revan and Malak returned, found them to be unbeatable. And that was because, like, Revan's forces were, were very battle-hardened. Revan was an excellent general. But also it just seemed like they had an unlimited army, unlimited reserves, and they couldn't really figure out what was going on. So eventually, the Jedi sent a strike team led by Bastila Shan, who was capable of force battle meditation and they went to battle but while Revan was distracted by fighting the Jedi and Bastila Malak decided from a ship and he's like I have my chance to become the Dark Lord of the Sith I have the chance to become the master rather than like always being Revan's sidekick and I can't imagine like after having Revan take off his jaw that he wanted to have revenge. So Malak opened fire on Revan's ship, and Revan was down, and he could have died, but, spoiler alert, Bastila saves him, and that creates a forced bond between them. And that brings us to Knights of the Old Republic 1, a.k.a. the greatest video game of all time! <laughs> Before we get into all that, you know, that would make an awesome, like, intro movie to Knights of the Republic. So if they start the story on capturing or, or saving uh, Revan from Malak, that'd be, that'd be an awesome story to tell. What if Knights of the Old Republic starts where the first game starts, but, and then in the first movie or television series or whatever, you have you start with that space battle, crash land to Terrace, getting off of Terrace. Dantooine may be the first planet, and then the second movie could be, like, going to the rest of the planets, ending on the Leviathan, losing Bastila, and Revan finding out who he is. And then the third movie could begin with a flashback, kind of saying, like, how all that happened. And, like, Revan's coming to terms with, like, who he is and, like, how he got there. Oh, man, now that sounds like Lord of the Rings and Smeagol. Well, I think it sounds like cinematic poetry, so... And Lord of the Rings is awesome in my book, so... I just think sometimes if you begin in the middle of the action and you discover things when the protagonist discovers it, rather than, like, knowing everything, I think it makes it more cinematic. Well, if they went, if they went like the TV show route, as as Revan regains his memories, you kind of get that prequel piece, like bit by bit, throughout the series. That would be kind of cool too. Yeah, because I would, I would kind of like Revan is on Dantooine. He kind of just has the muscle memory of like lightsaber fighting, and like maybe some of the younger students are kind of like, um, that move took me months but he got it in a day, you know, how is that happening? Or like, he kind of has memories of the war or something and it, it doesn't make sense because he's like, I didn't fight in that war, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it's going to be an interesting puzzle to crack, I think, writing uh, Knights of the Older Public into either a streaming service show or a trilogy, but I think it can be done. I guess, should we should we dive into uh, the story of KOTOR? Yeah. So, the Jedi Council, when they programmed a new identity for Revan, they kind of discovered, like, Bastila and Revan are linked. What if Revan has no idea who he is, 
Basilic kind of watches over him and we can figure out if we can use Revan f for our own purposes and he can maybe lead us to the reason why Revan and Malak are undefeatable. And so they end up being overtaken by Sith forces and they crash land onto Terrace and Revan crash lands with Cartho Nassi. But kind of traveling through all of Terrace's like upper city, lower cities, confronting Rackbulls and gangs. Revan also teams up with Mission and Zalbar and Candorous Ordo and T3M4 and they get off the planet in the best starship in the galaxy, the Ebon Hawk, and they go to Dantooine. And on Dantooine, that is where the Jedi Enclave is. And that is where you are given the task to go to Tatooine, Kashyyyk, Manon, and Korriban. Each of those worlds has a star map leading to a star forge. And your quest is to go to each world and find the map and find the hidden location for the star map. And just as about they're about to go to the last planet, Malik finds you and all of your party members are captured and Revan finds out he's Revan and then Vassal is captured and Revan has to deal with the fact that he is who he is. Were you surprised by the by who your protagonist was? You know I think I was a little bit when I played it the first time. Yeah. I mean there was there was little bits of I guess like memory recall that definitely hinted towards it but yeah I, I think it was the first time in a video game for me where it was just like, surprise, you're, you've been the bad guy the whole time. Where I was like, oh, okay. I guess all these bad choices, because I played Sith through the entire first uh, playthrough. I was like, I guess all these bad choices were the right thing to do. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I was kind of, I was spoiled, like, even before I played it. But I think I was still surprised. Like, wow, that actually was how it happened and like it makes sense and I think that's the best thing about twists is like if you lead up to them properly not just like be like blammo I subverted your expectations but you like lead up to it with good writing you know and usually like 10% of the audience can guess what the twist is gonna be and then looking back on it it's obvious but I think like Revan being Revan is like up there with Vader being Luke's father, honestly. And then after, of course, the Leviathan, Revan and his team, like, find the last star map, and then they find Lehan, which is the Rakadden world. They crash land there. And while on that world, Bastila confronts Revan and is like, do you want to be the Sith Lord again? Do you want to be Revan? Because she fell to the dark side and you're left with a choice, the light side or the dark side. And like, it's up to you. You can do, you can go either way. And it is fun to save at that temple and decide which way you want to go. But I am like a light sider at heart. So I always choose the right path, you know, the canonical light side. You don't kill members of your party, and you go to the Star Forge, you redeem Bastila, and you beat Malak, and you're uh, the savior of the Republic. In the dark side ending, you join Bastila, you kill Mission, you have Zalbar kill Mission, his best friend. It's dark. Karth runs away, and you kill Jolie and Juhani at the temple, and then you beat Malik, and then you're the Darth Revan again. But the canonical ending is the light side ending, and there's an interesting quote by Darth Malik. It goes, Savior, Conqueror, Hero, Villain. You are all these things, Revan, and yet you are nothing. In the end, you belong to neither the light nor the darkness. You will forever stand alone. And it's just interesting because it's like Revan is kind of like all over the place. And he's just distinct from a lot of the protagonists. Like, it would be interesting to see him and Anakin have a discussion. Because they kind of went on similar paths. Yeah, that's what I was saying too. I was like, amazing. Everything that Malak just said was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> 
but in a sense, he basically described himself though. I mean, Malik had no real allies. I mean, he had his army that was with him, but the, he had no, or Revan had Basilet and uh, Zalbar and all these other characters. Karth, Malik didn't have any of that. He just kind of had his pawns. And so, you know, at the same time, I don't think Revan could truly be accepted back into the, you know, like the Jedi Order, for example, just because of his history. And so what leads up next, leading up to KOTOR 2, I think makes the most sense because Malak was partially right where he he doesn't really belong to anything. Yeah. But that, but that doesn't mean he's without allies and friends. Revan, I mean, he came back to the light side, but he kind of is a bit like a Qui-Gon Jinn, I would say. is like he wants to serve the Force, not just be like follow the Jedi program. He was a staunch defender of like Jedi should have attachments because Bastila and Revan's love, it helped them save each other. And he just thought like the council was limited and they kind of were, <laughs> but he didn't get too much time to kind of figure stuff out with the Jedi council because he ended up going into the unknown regions about like a year after Knights of the Old Republic 1 and when Knights of the Old Republic 2 starts you are the exile you are someone who served in the war the Mandalorian Wars with Revan and Malak and you are the only one not to turn to the dark side and yeah you start and you learn that the exile's name is Mitra Surik and you learn more about Revan through Kreia. One of the and Kreia is one of the most like well written characters in all of Star Wars, and we are definitely gonna do an episode on her one of the days. But she just like tells you more about Revan, kind of like your old your old friend and comrade. And she's like, Revan had to learn everything. He was talented. He learned everything he could about the light and the dark. And she kind of hints that he probably fell because he was making a sacrifice for the greater good and the Republic needed to be in a position uh, of strength and like someone antagonizing them with a war would help them build up their strength. And Revan could like make strategic decisions. He would never like totally decimate the galaxy. He was always very strategic about what he did. So. I felt like I learned a whole lot about Revan in Knights of the Old Republic 2, even though he doesn't really appear outside of, like, visions. How do you think Revan would be handled on film? Because I think when I've talked to some people about the podcast I'm doing, they say, yeah, but the twist is out. Uh, it's an old video game. People aren't going to be surprised. And I was like, you know, do you think they really know about a 16-year-old video game? Like, does the general audience keep track of old video games and, like, keep track of spoilers and all that? And even if they did, I think, like, subverting people's expectations and always having a twist, it really limits the stories you can tell if you're just trying to shock people. When Game of Thrones began, they let up to the Red Wedding leading up like in th for three seasons and you didn't really see the twist coming but when it happened you were emotionally gutted but then you look back on it and it's like it couldn't have happened any other way and people were shocked but I think the Game of Thrones writers like never forgot about the Red Wedding and they were always trying to pull twists and uh, sometimes when you're so focused on twists, you end up with Game of Thrones Season 8, and it's kind of a dumpster fire. And all I will say about The Last Jedi is I don't think subverting people's expectations worked out the way Disney wanted it to. Yeah, now they're kind of on damage control and cleanup for this last film, which is too bad. It could have, you know, we, we don't know what it's going to be, obviously, at this point, but it could have been at a much 
you know, larger scale than what they left it at. So we'll see. Yeah. But what I mean is like Disney basically owns the cinematic market. And even if people do know the twist, I think they should focus on telling a good story and KOTOR has a great story. And if you own the game, who cares about shocking people? Like, it usually doesn't work out when people try to add twists to an existing story. Like, with The Hobbit, you know? Or sometimes you watch a film, like, that comes out and you see the twist once, but then you kind of know the twist is there. So you kind of just see it once in theater, and then the shock is gone. I don't think that's good storytelling. I think modern cinema and modern entertainment relies too heavily upon that rather than creating a good story. Yeah, it does. It does hurt the replayability. I was going to bring up, too, that pulling back to your earlier comment about the comment that was made where i mean it is a what a 16 year old video game now yeah and disney's major focus is to pull in a new audience for star wars yeah. and, and not really catering towards the old fans so it would make the most sense for them to tell the kotor story for the films because those those of us including the two of us have already enjoyed the story of KOTOR through the video game, but you know, some 10 year old kid or whatever doesn't want to sit through graphics of the 90s to you know, well, 2003, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but, um, anyway, some 10 year old kid doesn't want to sit through these, these decade old graphics to play a story that's that old. Uh, they would much rather either play a renewed video game or watch a movie of that story. Yeah. And Kathleen Kennedy was saying, like, with the sequel trilogy, they didn't really have books or anything to pull upon for inspiration, which is why you have the perfect opportunity with Knights of the Older Public, because the story already exists. And everyone loves it, you know? Prequel fans love it. Sequel fans love it. Original trilogy, everyone everyone loves Knights of the Old Republic. And everyone can get behind it. And the story is out there. It exists. And it's well proven. And it fits within Star Wars. And having it set 4,000 years before everything, it's within the same universe. But it doesn't have to like directly impact everything that's happening if they wanted to tell other stories and at different points of the timeline but yeah we can we can go we can talk for hours on Revan uh we've really only scratched the surface it's just visually I just think I've always thought he looks cool he has a great story he goes through a whole lot of character development and I would be excited to see him on the big screen. The one thing I wish they let you do in the video game was let you wear his mask, but you never could get his mask in the video game. All right, up next, we'll be talking about The Mandalorian, the latest episode. This discussion will contain spoilers, so if you wish to avoid the spoiler discussion, please fast forward to 46 minutes and 20 seconds where we will close out the episode. It'll take a few moments to plug the coordinates into the Navi computer, as jumping through hyperspace isn't like dusting crops, so we'll talk to you soon. Episode 3 of The Mandalorian was titled The Sin, and this is where I learned that the episodes are meant to be short, like 30 minutes long. Yeah, this uh, is the confirmation that all these episodes are going to be within about 30 to 35 minutes apiece. Yeah, and that like includes the recap and credits. So they're short serial-like episodes in the vein of Saturday morning cartoons, Buck Rogers, and Flash Gordon. But I find this to be solid Star Wars. It feels like solid prequel and original trilogy Star Wars. 
it ties everything together and I've really been digging it. I can see why Disney wanted to release it, even if like not to the whole world, but they wanted to get this out there. So I think like Goodwill is building up towards Rise of Skywalker. And you can tell, especially with this episode, you know, along with the two previous that everybody just loves making it. The different cast members love it. You watch some interviews and the actor that plays the Mandalorian. You know, he's, Pedro Pascal. Yeah, he's a huge Star Wars fan. He loves his character, and and so like you can you can kind of tell and kind of gauge the atmosphere of, or I guess everybody's like enjoyment of their own product that they're making. Yeah, uh, the writers and directors, you can tell that they respect Star Wars, and even like another layer like they really understand the mandalorian culture and i just wanted to give a huge shout out to the director of this episode great action in this episode and deborah chow did a great job and john favreau wrote this episode as well and i'm really looking forward to the obi-wan series because deborah chow is going to be directing directing the series and it's going to be in great hands because i i really enjoyed this episode yeah i mean if this is the future of star wars like i want more of this because that this is this is fun star wars yeah and what i loved about this episode is that there was a whole lot of character development Rewatching the force awakens one thing i didn't like was that ray didn't sell bb-8 for food and then regret it and then go back and save him she just thought about it and then oh this droid i've known for like you know a day is not for sale because you know i'm a saint you know she basically kept it because it was cute (laughs) yeah i guess she's that lonely but um (laughs) In this one, even though it's like a cute, adorable, rare baby, the Mandalorian is like, you know, he's a bounty hunter. Like, he does shady stuff, you know? He's not, like, always a good person. He's like, this baby's cute, I don't feel good about it, but I'll take the money and leave, you know? That's my job. And then it's not until he sees on his ship the cute, adorable choking hazard, like that little top of the control panel. That he's like, that's it, I'm going back for the baby. And he goes to break him out of the client's hideout. And you were kind of anticipating it to happen too, because as he was getting ready to turn in his bounty, he he wanted to know what they're going to do with it, which does he need to know? I get, you know, maybe not. That's not really part of being a bounty hunter. But it did show that he was genuinely interested in the well-being of this baby like why do they want him and when nobody had a good answer for him you know that was that was a telltale sign that he's like that he was going to make that decision of you know what i'm done with this and he goes and rescues him what got me was basically it was a renouncement of his profession to go rescue baby yoda and so did the did the Mandalorians agree with his cause or did they save him out of like a brotherhood? So maybe they disagreed with his decision, but they still came to his aid because he needed it. I would like to see that answered, you know, whether they do that as a real time event in the show or if they just kind of casually explain it. Uh, That'd be something I'd be interested to kind of get cleared up and followed up on. I think it was out of, like, shared identity, because after the Purge, we don't really know exactly what the Purge is, but it looks like after Star Wars Rebels, the Mandalorians are not in a good place. The Mandalorians haven't really been in a good place for a long time. One of the For first... a long time, yeah. They were in a better place in Rebels. They were leading like an uprising against the empire but it was called the purge so i don't think it ended well because it looks like the mandalorians kind of have to live in the underground and kind of not have too much of a presence which is like after the mandalorian took the best scar from warner herzog's character 
he went to he went and tried to learn a bit more about what happened to the child, but he didn't really learn anything. And then he got his new impressive set of complete armor forged at the fancy Star Wars forge and the rest of the Mandalorians were kind of jealous and then they said something weird like have you ever taken off your helmet and they're like no and I don't let anyone else do that and it's like I can understand not letting anyone else take off your helmet but then I was kind of thinking about like what about when they eat or like drink or like shower or what if like in a romantic situation and I was kind of just like that's an interesting conundrum to never take off your helmet. So I, I kind of wondered what they meant by that. Yeah, it's like no wonder Boba Fett's armor oxidized and became green. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, the armor is impressive. I'd be impressed by that armor and want to steal it. Yeah. Um, well, it's very reminiscent to the Jango Fett armor where they look very well the same. The, the major difference is that Jango Fett wore a blue kind of under garment underneath his armor whereas yeah. the mandalorian was brown and so it I, I felt like jingle fett's armor popped a bit more because of the blue but yeah. it's still you know it's still that brand new shiny you know i guess chrome chrome like armor which looked really good still yeah i think this is kind of meant to be kind of like a lived in universe so it kind of makes sense that he's in brown and Jango Fett kind of was like silver and blue, kind of more like the prequel era. Everything looked nice and grand, but then the original trilogy, it's like, and everything went down from there. Yeah, so. and on top of that, Jango Fett was filthy rich compared to the Mandalorian. Definitely, yeah. And so we're, there were some nice Mandalorian Easter eggs. There was the Mythosaur on the ceiling above everyone. So that was that was a nice detail. I, I kind of hope we end up seeing a mythosaur in either this season or the next season or maybe even a movie one day. And then he talks to Grief to get a new job after his armor is completed. And he goes just about to get a bounty for on a royal man calamari. But just when he's about to leave, he sees that knob missing on the lever and then he's like oh no that choking hazard i need to go get that baby and it's like looking at baby yoda like i'd miss baby yoda i wouldn't let him i wouldn't let that happen to him so he violates the bounty hunter code and he's going back and he is not leaving without his baby yoda you know and there confirms our previous uh joke of the Mandalorian and the Mandalorian Jedi baby. Yeah, I hope that Baby Yoda becomes a Mandalorian. He would be the most powerful and most adorable thing in the entire galaxy for a long time. But yeah, it's interesting. We don't really know what the client and the scientist want with the Baby Yoda. They're talking about like extracting something from him and we're like, are they trying to extract Medichlorians or what, you know, or just DNA? Or the Mandalorian kills all of the stormtroopers kind of by the skin of his teeth. But he doesn't kill Dr. Pershing because Dr. Pershing seems to, he seems to really care about baby Yoda. So he's like, oh, fine, I won't do anything to him because he, he seemed to just be caught up in the situation. But one interesting thing is that the, the doctor calls Baby Yoda a him, so it confirms that Baby Yoda is a boy, not a baby yaddle. So, you know, coming up or bringing up that point of like what they were extracting from Baby Yoda, there was a instance in kind of old canon, so legend canon, of Qui Gon Jinn kind of tangling with a scientist um this is back in the uh the jude watson series jedi apprentice um, yeah i was thinking about that too yeah she had believed that the midichlorians were contained in in the blood of a force sensitive individual and so kind of the plot of that story was she was going to drain qui-gon and Jin's blood and you know replicate it basically make everybody special yeah but then it didn't work so there's 
there's more to the force than just you know like dna and blood but it is interesting because you can see like the physical evidence of the force but it's mythical and the force it, like there's science and then there's kind of that mystical aspect to it so yeah almost it's like a almost a, like a deity calling at the same time of but also showing f physical evidence so it requires both to manifest into being a force sensitive individual yeah some people are like oh metachlorians ruins the force but it's like if you look at like the stories like say for example like stories about the moon you can have like a beautiful myth about the moon you know and like where the tides come from but i mean you can know the the story or not the story but like the science behind the moon and what causes the tide but that doesn't mean that the story like isn't beautiful you know they kind of complement each other you know so then baby yoda and the mandalorian they really none of these people really have names they escape together baby yoda looks like he's been through some stuff it was interesting to kind of see like it, it seemed like baby yoda had had matured a bit you know like just in that short amount of time and they escape together and they're almost not going to make it because all the bounty hunters are going after the Mandalorian. And just when you think all hope is lost, the Mandalorians come in on their jetpacks and take everyone down and help him escape. And it kind of really reminded me of the Mandalorians, like how they would kind of go on their jetpacks and just kind of go up and down like in Clone Wars, like when the Death Watch first appeared, I was like, that really looks like when the death watch appeared like in the clone wars but in live action it was pretty cool to see them kind of reveal themselves together to protect each other because this is the way you know like when you're a mandalorian you protect your people like even if you don't agree with them and i love his and comment was... where he says i gotta get me one of those i mean he turned in so much of that material that i'm surprised that he couldn't afford one of those yeah it was actually funny because um john favreau ended up having a voice credit for the character that wanted to take off the mandalorian's helmet and the last name was Vizla, which is shared with mandalore the avenger from star wars the old republic so we got some linkages going on there but then the Mandalorian gets the Yoda baby getaway uh, thanks to the help of the other Mandalorians. And they take off, but they know they're probably not free and people are probably going to come for them. Where do you think it'll go from here? It could go anywhere. One one thing is for sure, I mean, the, uh, the one bounty collector, he survived, but the Mandalorian can't really... I mean, if he goes and he collects the bounty, is the bounty collector going to honor the collect, or is he going to treat him hostile? It'd be interesting to see what happens if if that's the route they pursue, where they just set aside that difference and conduct business, because ultimately the bounty hunting business really just cares about making money. And yeah. so would they put aside that difference to make money, which is ultimately their primary priority? Yeah, it sets up, like, interesting conundrums for a lot of people because I'm sure the Mandalorian has friends. But when there's money involved, there is no honor among thieves. But the Mandalorian wants to protect the child. And we'll just have to see what happens because it looks like the remnants of the Empire and bounty hunters will, will be after them. So it'll be very interesting to see. What goes on from here and if uh baby yoda is gonna be in every episode or just the first few episodes but i want to see more of baby yoda i want to see what happens and i want to see like i want to learn more about the mandalorian i'm intrigued about this character mm -hmm. and we for you know we forget that he, baby yoda is 50 and so in in the level of maturity that that species undergoes it is a it is a baby just with the lifespan that they can have but at the same time like that's that's 50 years of maturity that the mandalorian doesn't have and so you know there's like those little subtle details of the of the little baby yoda pulling that 
I guess that fall off the lever was that a test of patience uh being that is 50 years old was that a a test of patience or was it just messing around even uh yoda in empire strikes back does that to luke where he goes through all his stuff and throws around you know makes a total mess and he does it to see how luke would react and that's very possible that little baby yoda was doing that to test who he was you know who he was hanging out with that would be an interesting wrinkle in everything but i am just praying and hoping we have more baby yoda for years to come dare i say it (laughs) (laughs) i'll definitely be there in the merchandise we want to welcome back those that have skipped through the spoiler section uh this has been cassia and this has been Coden. you can find uh, me at twitch.tv forward slash conan bun for various star wars game streaming currently messing around on star wars the jedi fallen order you can find me tweeting out of when episodes go live as well as uh, streaming events on twitter and that's at code and bond and then if you have any emails or comments you can send them to ebonhawk podcast at gmail.com and you can find me at ebonhawk podcast on instagram our intro and outro themes were composed by alistair scheuermann he can be found at alistair.wixsite.com forward slash Alistair Sounds. Our transition music was composed by Christian Walker. He can be found at christianwalkermusic.com. This has been episode 5 of The Ebon Hawk. Take care of yourselves, meatbags, and may the force be with you. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. <laughs>